Hey, this is Anthony Davis with Shapeshift Wellness, and in today's video, I'm going to talk about hip joint compression during flexion of the hip. That's like a forward fold for you yoga people out there. And I'm going to do that by looking at a quiz that I put out recently, uh, explaining the answers, the correct and incorrect answers. I'll do that by talking about yoga, a little bit about movement, a little bit about femoral acetabular impingement, FAI. And at the end of the video, be sure to stick around to the end because I'll talk about specifically how to modify yoga poses. And I've got a fun little test for you uh, where you can prove to yourself that the concepts I'm teaching in this video are accurate. So let's get to it. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel so you get notifications on future videos, and share this with your anatomy-loving friends. All right, let's check it out. As usual, we're gonna start with a quiz. So I want you to pause the video, read this quiz here, uh, read the possible answers, and come up with a solution, and then I'll explain the quiz in a moment. So pause the video and do that. Okay, so I'm hoping that you pause the video. In forward folds, which femur position creates the least hip joint compression? Internal rotation, external rotation, neutral, or it doesn't matter. Well, um, neutral, or excuse me, let's start from A, internal rotation. Internal rotation is the most common cue during forward folds. Most yoga teachers, in my experience in teaching yoga in a whole bunch of places and practicing for years, most people cue internal rotation of the thighs that would look like this. So spinning the inner thighs inward during a forward fold. That's wrong uh, in terms of joint compression, okay? It's not like a death sentence. It's not gonna ruin your hip joints or something silly like that. It's just creating less space. Now we can use that information to make educated choices about our yoga, but right now let's just talk about hip joint compression. Internal rotation is going to create the most hip joint compression, okay? And it would happen right here in the front inside of the hip. External rotation is the correct answer, and we'll talk about that. Uh, why is it not neutral? Well. It compression is going to be on a spectrum. So although neutral is a really good place to start with a lot of joint stuff, usually things are easier in a neutral position and then they become more difficult in a non-neutral position. So that's a good kind of rule of thumb. However, in this particular case, neutral would be on the middle of the spectrum of compression and then internal rotation would be the most and external would be uh, the least doesn't matter. A lot, of, a lot of people are in this doesn't matter camp that biomechanics don't matter. Who cares if you're compressing your hip joint? Whatever. Just let people do whatever they want to do. Well, sometimes when you feel it out and you do what feels good, hey, heroin feels good. And that's not a great choice, right? Not a great life choice to, if I had continued to do heroin from when I was in high school, I would be in a very bad place right now. Um, but it felt good. Drugs feel good. Booze feel good. So not everything that feels good is good. Okay. So we, yeah, let's allow for variation, but that's a silly argument. Um, biomechanics do matter. We don't need to scare people. We don't need to be telling people that, oh my God, if you internally rotate, you're going to die. But we can suggest smarter cues. And then if somebody's like, ah, I don't care how biomechanically smart it is. It doesn't feel good in my hip. Then it's your job to say, okay, great. Then let's try something different. Okay. So this is the create. Why? Why is this the answer? It's all about space. It's just geometry. So in this video, uh, I, I said that we were going to talk about a spectrum here. So this is the spectrum um, from the most compression, which is going to happen with internal rotation and adduction. Remember, all this is in flexion. Only we're, ta we're only talking about flexion of the hip. Flexion of the hip is like trying to draw your knee to your chest or do any kind of forward fold. Child's pose, Uttanasana, Paschimottanasana, Prasarita, Padottadasana, whatever. So that's the most compression. And then what do we do in yoga? Well, if this is a person here and they've got legs and here's you know another leg and here's the other part of their hip and here they are. Well, <laughs> in yoga, we, we keep our feet together, right? And we spin the inner thighs in 
That's what we're that's what we're being taught. Most yoga teachers that I've seen are teaching that. Well, that's the most compressive uh, action right here. It's right in this area that you get compression right here. So that's the most compression. Neutral would be middle of the road, and then um, inflection. External rotation and abduction is going to be the best. So external rotation and abduction is going to have the least amount of compression right here because you're drawing this bone out away. You're widening that space right here. Okay. So you're externally rotating the femur. Okay. So let's talk about femoral acetabular impingement. There are two types of impingement. Cam and a pincer. Cam is where the femoral neck has a little buildup of bone, and a pincer is where the actual like rim of, of the acetabulum has a buildup of bone. Essentially, the reason this is important is because if you take this bone here, you know, if you take this and you draw it this way, that essentially is taking your acetabulum and drawing it this way. As those two bones approximate, as they get closer together, it there's a geometrical, there's a, a physical limitation of space. Okay. So if somebody has bone development that is different and people have all kinds of weird bone development, not just FAI, but uh, retroversion, antiversion, different angles, um, uh, coxivalga, coxivera. So there's all kinds of different angles. So that would be um, this angle here can be different, right? It could be less or it could be more. Um, and your femur could be forward or backwards facing. So that would change the space. But basically what we're saying is that we're approximating these two uh, bones. I don't like the idea of a bone on bone, but it's just because really what you're doing is squishing the soft tissue in between those bones. But you, there's just physically less space. So we'll we'll explore that in a second. So here's, um, here's a fader test that is flexion, adduction, and internal rotation of the hip. This is a test to see if somebody has FAI. So this is an orthopedic test. Don't, if you're a yoga teacher, don't be doing this to your yoga students. You're not allowed to do that. You don't have a license to practice like that. But this is something that physical therapists and chiropractors and osteopaths and um, you know f f uh, physiatrists and whatever. This is what they do. Um, orthopedists uh, are going to do, to do this to see if you have FAI. So what they do is they take your femur from a neutral, from like a normal position in flexion, and then they internally rotate your leg and adduct into flexion. So they draw your knee in like that. Well, if we're doing that intentionally during forward folds in yoga, then we're physically limiting the space. We're, this is a test that's designed to aggravate that area and, and elicit a painful response. So that's a, that would be a confirmative for um, FAI. So why would we intentionally do that in yoga? That just seems silly to me. So try it. Get off your butt if I'm assuming you're sitting down. Get up and let's try this out, okay? Pause the video if you need to get oriented. I want you to sit on the floor. You're going to try the position A first, and then you're going to try position B second, okay? So position A, sit on your, bum, on your bum and put your feet together, or sorry, your feet wide and your knees together, okay? And... What you're going to do is you're going to try and take your heart and move it forward and see if you can really, you're taking your belly button and trying to move it forward. In other words, try to do a forward fold and see how far you can push forward. It might actually hurt, so be careful, but um, you're going to see that you, you just, there's no space. There's physically no space when you internally rotate. This is internal rotation and of the femurs, and you just physically don't have any space. There's nowhere to go. So now let's try the opposite. Let's try B, where we do external rotation. And I want, so you, it's supta baddha konasana. So you um, take, except, you know, you're not, except for without the supta, you're not laying down. So feet together and knees externally rotated, moving away from each other. And you'll see that you can take your belly button and you can move it forward. You have, you just have physically way more space because your bones, your 
leg bones, your femurs are just not in the way anymore. So, um, I hope that just proves it to you. Now, granted, this is these are two very dramatic examples. So if you're doing a forward fold like Uttanasana, where you're standing and your feet are kind of wide and you're folding forward, like this pose, then you're not it's not gonna not as dramatic. You're not gonna be able to physically internally rotate to this degree that you can in this particular uh, pose A, right? Or and you're not going to be able to externally rotate as much as pose B. These are the extremes. So how much of a difference does it make in a forward fold? How much can you really externally or internally rotate? Uh, less. But that less could matter for somebody. And it probably matters for a number of people if we're forcefully taking our feet together and internally rotating. So you notice this is me. I'm doing a forward fold. Notice my feet are... Um, right here and right here. So my feet are wide. I have a wide base of support. My knees have a, a little bend in them. And my knees are also spreading apart. I'm taking my knees and I'm drawing them externally. Oops, there we go. So I'm drawing my knees out away from one another. And even while I'm creating space, you'll notice that, and I'm very flexible, that my back is still rounding. Now, it's not that it's bad if your back rounds. It's not like it's bad for your back to have flexion in it. It's okay to have flexion in your spine. But what this is an indication of that my back is not flat is that I'm compensating, is that I've run out of space in my hip joint and therefore my spine has to round in order to uh, touch my toes, right? So I'm not achieving that motion through my hip joint. It's not bad. It's not bad for my back or anything. It's perfectly fine for my back to round it. However, it's just an indication that I do not have any additional motion from my hip joint. I've run out of hip space, even while I'm trying to externally rotate and widen my feet. Now imagine how soon I would run out of space if my feet were together and my thighs were spinning in. My inner thighs in, My uh, I hear widen the sitting bones, spin your inner thighs back, um, You know, knees touching, to big toes together. Those kinds of things are silly. Uh, they're ridiculous to me. So, so what? How do we um, minimize the joint compression in the hips during flexion? Well, we're during hip flexion. It's pretty simple. Just uh, try to have wide feet. That's going to create some space. Try to externally rotate. That's going to have some space. So uh, cues for that. How do you cue that? Uh, okay, if we're doing a Uttanasana, come to the top of your mat, stand with your feet, about hips width distance, create a nice wide base of support so you have some room in your hip joints. And uh, as you fold forward, uh, look at your kneecaps and point your kneecaps outward. You know, so your bit, your toes can continue to point forward, but just spin your kneecaps outward. Or you could say, uh, spin your outer thighs backwards or spin your inner thighs forward, anything like that. It's, it's not that hard. Um, and your toes don't need to necessarily go out. In fact, I would say keep your toes forward and then spin the kneecaps out. There's reasons for that, but uh, that's not the scope of this video. Allow for variation. So just because we have these ideas of wide feet and external rotation, well, somebody out there is going to try that. And they're going to be like, ah, nope, I don't like it. It hurts. So you need to allow for variation. If somebody's like, yeah, I'm trying this and it doesn't work for me, then you need to just say, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Do something else then. <laughs> Do something that feels good. Uh, you know, I at that point, right? So don't adhere to dogma and never force it. Um, that's a, another really easy way to avoid compression is just don't grab your toes. This picture here, this is stupid. I don't do this anymore. I don't grab my toes and pull myself down. This is silly. I, there's no reason for me to do that. Um, if you're pulling yourself, wrenching yourself into a forward fold, there's no benefit to that. It doesn't make you a healthier person. Why are we doing it? You're creating compression. It's needless. You're not in control of your range of motion. I don't see the point. So never force. So I hope this video taught you a little bit about hip joint compression. Again, the compression site is right here. And uh, that this gives you some ideas of how to change your yoga practice or your movement practice to be smarter. Please don't take this as dogmatic. Please don't take this as I have to always have wide feet and always externally rotate as much as possible. More is better. And other, otherwise, my hip is going to blow up. 
That's not true. This is just food for thought. This is a way to create space and make a pose easier um, on the hip joints uh, for more people. It's better for more people. It doesn't mean it's the only way for everybody. Okay? Share this with your friends. Like this video. Subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you in the next episode.